I made this solar collector almost a year ago, and then I performed some technical testing of the collector in different weather conditions. In addition, I measured the energy capabilities of this solar collector, and now I am showing one of my experiments when the collector has heated 36 liters of water of this tank from a temperature of 14 degrees Celsius to 680 degrees Celsius for 3 hours. These are my costs of materials for the collector, and we can calculate that it is about $8 per square meter, and this is 20 or 30 times cheaper than these famous flat plate solar collectors which are the basis of such large solar stations for district heating of towns, hot water supply of large objects or heat for industrial processes of various factories. Similar solar stations compete with natural gas, coal and other heat sources. And it is obvious that our solar collectors must be very cheap if we want our solar energy to win the competition. So, let's create the cheapest flat plate solar collector in the world, and let's look at its energy capabilities and other features. This is my choice of the cheapest body of my collector and its thermal insulation. We see that this is expanded polystyrene and several wooden battens which must resist wind, weight and pressure of water. This thin steel sheet is my choice for the cheapest absorber, and I coated the sheet with cheap black paint. We must pay attention to these holes for the circulation of water which will take solar heat from the black steel sheet. The water will move inside a similar polymer sleeve, and now I am showing the installation of the sleeves inside those holes. Now we see that the sun heats the black sheet which transfers the heat to the water that moves inside those sleeves. It is interesting to note that this thin black sheet reliably resists the pressure of the water inside the sleeves, and therefore we can reduce the thickness of the steel sheet which is now equal to 300 microns, or we can increase this interval which is now equal to 15 centimeters, but we need to understand that increasing the interval increases the risk that the water pressure will destroy this polystyrene. I think you already understood that our heat carrier is not antifreeze, but ordinary water, and the last minutes of this video will tell why the water will not freeze in winter. It is well known that the cheapest transparent covering of a solar collector is a transparent polyethylene film which is intended for cheap greenhouses. This wire should not be made of ordinary steel because it creates rusty marks on the inside of the film. Now I am showing one of the options for fixing the edges of the film, but the interval between the staples should be several times smaller. We must pay attention to these wooden stakes and these wooden battens, and this technical solution is the cheapest option for fixing our collector on the ground. Of course, this is just one section, and we must have many such sections which form a long row, similar to the rows of this solar station. The installation of these stakes is the initial stage of construction of our collector row, and then we install these bodies of the sections with the black sheets. After that, we pull long polymer sleeves through entire row of our collectors, and then we have to connect the edges of the sleeves with the water inlets and outlets, and the construction of our collector row ends with installation of a similar transparent film with a length of up to several tens of meters. Of course, we must measure the real energy capabilities of our cheap solar collector, and this is my measurement of its energy parameters, although my calculations of its heat production will use these degraded parameters which take into account the impact of dirt, snow and aging of the collector. Obviously, our parameters are noticeably worse than these energy parameters of expensive flat plate solar collectors, but we have many opportunities to improve our parameters, and for example, one of my future videos will describe this solar collector which uses glass sheets instead of our cheap transparent film. In addition, our energy parameters will be better if we coat our steel sheet not with black paint, but with a selective coating, however we must pay attention to this test of stagnation of our cheap solar collector when its water temperature reached 100 degrees Celsius, and the ambient temperature was 29 degrees Celsius. My collector will withstand 100 degrees Celsius, and I will show its condition after several dozen stagnations in that future video about my collector with glass sheets, but unfortunately, the glass or the selective coating will increase the stagnation temperature, and this fact will require the use of more heat-resistant materials instead of my polystyrene, 
polyethylene and polyurethane. Let's see the cost of heat which is produced by this solar collector, and this table describes the annual heat production from one square meter of our collector and the cost of our heat for different temperatures in the United States, Europe, and India, and I calculated the cost of the heat on the basis of this cost of capital and labor. These are the cases when the cost of our solar heat is approximately equal to the cost of heat from natural gas, and we see that they correspond to the water temperatures of 65 or 85 degrees Celsius. However, a decrease in the water temperature significantly increases the annual production of our heat, and therefore its cost decreases, and these are the cases when our solar heat is about 10 times cheaper than heat from natural gas. This is an example of calculating the cost of our heat, but it is obvious that it will be true if our spending money and time reaches these targets. We can notice that I have already increased the cost of materials for the collector because later I will recommend the use of more expensive polymer sleeves. This target is achievable only for cases of automated production of certain parts of our collector by a factory because soldering those polymer sleeves in a home workshop can be time-consuming in comparison with such automatic production of a polymeric sleeve of the desired size. In addition, the installation of these wooden beams on the polis tiring in a home workshop may require more time than we think, and now we see that the steel sheet is fixed by these small screws, but it is also time-consuming operation, and it is obvious that the screws are better to replace with some cheap glue. Of course. This transparent film requires periodic replacements, and we know that some brands of films for greenhouses can be operated for several years, and the process of replacing the film gives us the opportunity to wash the steel sheet or to repaint it if need be. In addition, washing the film in a few months may be desirable if we use the film with a long life, however we do not need to spend time removing snow from the collector because snow can quickly leave the surface of the film as soon as the sun appears, but it is obvious that a snowy region requires a higher gap between the collector and the ground than we see now. Of course, these polymeric sleeves will age due to the high temperature of the water, but the good thing is that they will be completely covered from their destruction by the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, although here we see small uncovered zones of the sleeves, and obviously we have to cover them. Interestingly, we have the ability to replace sleeves, but it seemed to me that an old sleeve may slightly stick to the steel sheet, and this phenomenon can lead to more time-consuming removal of old sleeves. I think that if the temperature of our water is less than 40 or 50 degrees Celsius, then those replacements of the sleeves will not be needed because 10 years of their lifespan correspond to approximately 20,000 hours of their operation with the warm water, and this low-density polyethylene has to withstand those 20,000 hours. However I recommend increasing the thickness of the polyethylene compared to these sleeves which have a wall thickness of 100 microns. Unfortunately, I am afraid that higher water temperatures will reduce the lifespan of these sleeves lower than 10 or 15 years, and this may require the use of a more heat-resistant polymer for the sleeves, for example, high-density polyethylene or polypropylene. In addition, we may need to make periodic replacements of these wooden stakes, and I remind you that replacement of stakes for my solar station were described in another of my videos about a month ago, and a pine stake without antiseptic impregnation has a lifespan of about 4 years, but I hope that its antiseptic impregnation can increase its lifespan several times. We see that an edge of our polymer sleeve connects to a polypropylene tube by means of a rubber ring and a steel clamp. This is a more tight connection using two rubber rings and clamps. Now I am showing one of my experiments with installing the connection here, but it is obvious that the installation of the connection outside the collector is more convenient. This is our water inlet and these holes can have a different diameter if we want approximately the same water flow through all polymer sleeves, and it is obvious that the diameter of the upper holes is larger than the lower. Our water outlet is similar, but these tubes have wide passages instead of those small holes, and here we see an uncovered pipe which can be a passage for the air. This is the intermediate stage of installing our water inlet 
and we see that the edges of the sleeves are temporarily fixed on the polypropylene tubes with adhesive tape. And now I am showing the final stage of installing the inlet. This is a primitive demonstration of the basic principles of the connection of our solar collector, this water tank and this pump, and I will explain why the water will completely leave the collector after turning off the pump, and therefore it will not freeze inside the collector at night due to frost. We see that the pump takes water from the tank through this hose and directs the water through this hose to the water inlet of the collector. Here we see how the water leaves the collector through the water outlet and returns to the tank. Let's look at my pump in more detail, and this is its input with a return valve and a filter, and we see that the pump directs the water towards the collector through this hose and towards the tank through this hose, and this valve gives us the opportunity to change the proportion of the water which moves to the tank and not to the collector. Here we see that now the pump is disconnected from electricity. And we understand that this is the water which goes from the collector through its outlet. This is the water which leaves the collector through its inlet. Goes through this hose. And then the water comes to the tank through this path. After 7 minutes, this water flow has stopped. But this flow of the water from the inlet of the collector is still going. It took another 6 minutes, and we see that the water stopped flowing from the collector, but if we want the water to completely leave the collector, our equipment must meet the following conditions. First, these water inlets should be located at the bottom of the polymer sleeves. At the same time, the water outlets should be at the top of the sleeves. Secondly, the collector should have a slight slope so that this edge is a few centimeters below this edge. Thirdly, the water tank should be below the collector, but we must pay attention to this point which is now higher than the lower edge of the collector, and this is my big mistake, because now the collector is still filled with the water which is above this point, and we will see this now. Now I will show flow of the water which did not leave the collector due to my mistake and therefore I must repeat my experiment, and the pump must again fill the collector with water. This is the end of my new experiment. So, either this point must be located below the collector, or this hose must be connected to the tank in some other way, and now I place the hose below the collector. And we see the remains of water because of that mistake. After 20 minutes, the flow of water stopped. And now we will see that the water completely left the collector and I corrected my mistake. Interestingly, here we see the water level which now fills the hoses and the pump, and it is obvious that we must protect the equipment from freezing in a manner similar to this widely known method which is called the term drain back. It is important to note that sometimes drops of the water can leave the collector, and this phenomenon can cause an ice plug. Interestingly, now the temperature of the surrounding air is several degrees Celsius below zero, but we will see some remaining water in the polymer sleeves, and this water is not ice due to the fact that the sun slightly heats the collector through the overcast sky. Thus, we saw that connecting this collector is difficult, and therefore I say that this collector is inconvenient for a single family house, but those difficulties should not be a problem for engineers of a large solar station which is designed to produce large amount of very cheap solar heat.